Um, Are we still on? Oh yeah, we're still live, but my live my uh, recording encoder just stopped. Uh, okay, so we're going now. So uh, uh, you didn't. Nobody missed anything. So <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, yeah, the website, uh, themeathouse.com. Uh, we do have a call-in number. It's 818-921-4680. If you catch the show live want to join us, uh, 818-921-4680. We'll be glad to take your call uh, anytime during the show uh, and talk about whatever's on your mind as long as it's about mead. <laughs> uh, <coughs> What are we drinking tonight? Uh, Aaron, you, you got uh, some kind of raspberry thing going on there. I do, yeah. This is the batch of mead that I uh, briefly talked about last week on the show. My raspberry melomel bottled back in December 2014. Um, this is that one that I just had the joys of forcing all of those raspberries down the tiny little neck of my glass carboy and my wife was there. It was a labor of love with, with her being a second pair of hands there for me, uh, both getting them in and then the fun of, of getting that raspberry sludge out on the back end. But uh, breaking this open tonight. Awesome. And, uh, Jeff, what are you drinking there tonight? I've got a, uh, a little uh, project of mine that I've spent most of last year on. It's kind of a, a hybrid braggot of uh, – Porter grains and uh, the the boche like caramelized mead, so it is it is so dark that it is absolutely opaque, um, and it has that wonderful rich like malty toasty complexity you get from the both the porter and the caramelized honey. Ooh, that sounds good. Yeah. And uh, Chris, are you off them pain meds yet? Uh... <laughs> not not no not really. <laughs> so Chris, but I have got a I have got a nice cup of. Uh, Starbucks, uh, Keurig, uh, Dark Rose. <laughs> Chris, you're on the wrong show, man. <laughs> this will have to do for now. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, Chris uh, still fighting off that uh, car wreck he was in here a couple weeks ago. So, uh, But I'm glad you're doing better. I, I, I talked to him last night, and uh, he's, he's getting to sound like the old Chris I remember. So. Good to hear. Uh, yeah. I'm drinking. Well, I took off the cobwebs by now, so I'm good. There you go. <laughs> I'm drinking a, a batch of Kentucky Wood. This is a hard cider that I made. Uh, oh gosh, it's probably been about eight months ago or more. Uh, and I, you know, this is about the most simplest recipe that I've found. Uh, and it's one of my first batches of hard cider that I made, and it's it's just simply apple juice, brown sugar, and yeast. Uh, and I think I used the Nottingham Ale yeast. Uh, it's five gallons of apple cider, apple juice, and uh, two pounds of brown sugar. And, you, you know, you, you just let it ferment out until the yeast just gives up and dies. Uh you know, rack it off into a clean carboy, let it all settle out real good. It becomes clear. And uh, I dropped uh, one of them oak spirals into it, an American oak. I think it was a medium toast oak. And let it sit in there for, I don't know, I guess about maybe 10 days. And this tastes like, uh, it, it, tastes like uh, it tastes like an apple juice that's been sitting in a wooden barrel that's got a kick to it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so sounds good. Yeah, it's 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 really good. I'm really it's got that tart apple flavor, uh, just a hint of sweetness, and and the sweetness actually almost tastes like it comes from the apple itself. And then of course you get that uh, you get that whiff of that oak barrel, uh, and that and that taste that woodsy taste uh, from the oak barrel. So it's it's real good. I'm real pleased with it. That sounds real tasty, JD. How how does that brown sugar translate through? Are you do you get any of that flavor after it ferments out? No, not really. Uh, and I'm you know, and I need to figure out if it's the uh, you know why you couldn't use any other kind of sugar, or even I guess if you used a honey, it would be called a sizer, wouldn't it? Um, yeah. You know, I, I don't know that the brown sugar really imparts any flavor to it at all. Uh, 
I suppose it would if you took it up to the sweet side, uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, kind of boosts the alcohol a little bit. And yeah. I think something maybe like some turbinado sugar that's that's absolute raw sugar would probably impart more flavor than the brown sugar. But yeah. I bet I bet in a side by side comparison, I bet you could tell the difference. Yeah, could be. Uh, this came out to about twelve percent uh, ABV, uh, so it's uh, you know maybe the lower end of the wine scale. Uh, uh, but to drink a full three hundred and seventy five mil bottle, it, it'll lighten your head up a little bit for sure. Uh, <laughs> I <know>? like it. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's, it's it's one of those things that just kind of creeps up on you after a while. It tastes really good, and the more you drink, and the lighter the head gets, you know? Yeah, that's like the hydrocodone. They do sound the same thing. You know? <laughs> yeah, I'll send you a bottle. I just, if, I could, if I could just figure out how to get some oak flavor on them, they'd be, we'd be set. <laughs> Who needs <Yeah>. mead? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, gosh. No kidding. No kidding. Um, you know, tonight, uh, we were going to talk about, um, we were going to talk about, uh, putting a, a sweet mead together and, uh, the first part of the show and, and then go into dealing with stuck fermentations. I know we've all been there and done that. Um, Chris and uh, Chris and Aaron uh, been both uh, really contributed uh, uh, to this uh, sweet mead recipe. And uh, Chris, this is uh, this is kind of your baby. I know you you've done this recipe before. Uh, Start it out uh, for us. What what are we looking at here? Okay, uh, this is a recipe that, that I've done many, many times. It's a favorite of everyone that, that tastes it. And uh, I, I had suggested that maybe we should start out, since this is a new show and there may be brand new mead makers listening, um, we need to start out with the basics. Uh, we use a lot of terminology that people may not no, we, we just kind of throw these words around because we've done it for a while, but you mead makers may have no clue what we're talking about. So I wanted to cover some of the terminology that we're using, give you a, a good basic recipe that will get you started. And, uh, it's been made enough now that if you, I know for a fact, if you follow the directions, it's going to turn out good for you. And you don't have to have a, a lot of equipment and things to do, but there are some things that are essential. Uh, this is going to be an orange blossom sweet mead, and we're going to add a little bit of vanilla at the end uh, just to uh, kind of enhance it a little bit. Uh, you're going to be using 20 pounds of orange blossom honey, and you're going to need to get you a 7.9 gallon bucket, a uh, fermentation bucket. They're available at most all homebrew shops and uh, online homebrew stores. I think they run about 15, 16 bucks or so. Um, you're going to need that extra space. So, um, and the other thing, the other two pieces of equipment you're going to need right off are a Lee's stirrer that mounts in a hand drill. And you can, if you don't have a drill, you can borrow one from your neighbor. Uh, and you're going to need a hydrometer and start learning how to use your, your hydrometer to take a specific gravity. And, uh, so basically you're going to put 20 pounds of orange blossom honey into your big bucket. You're going to, uh, add about a gallon of spring water. And you're going to mix it up until the honey dissolves. And at that point, you're going to have basically a syrup. Uh, you're going to then continue adding water uh, until you get up to somewhere around five gallons. And then you're going to stop and take a hydrometer reading. Uh, just make sure that you uh, have everything mixed up and incorporated well uh, because you won't get an accurate reading if it's not fully dissolved. So what you're looking for is a gravity of about 1.134. 
you will hear us refer to that as 1134. We usually just leave out the decimal. And so that's how we'll, when you hear us talking about something that's 1050, that's 1.050 on your hydrometer. So you're looking for a gravity of 1134. You're going to probably need to add a little more water past five gallons. Uh, you should be coming up somewhere, give or take, five and a half gallons, and that's going to leave a, a little extra so that when you do your racking later on or your siphoning, uh, you won't have to worry about getting into the sediment. And you'll be sure to be able to top up your five-gallon carboy all the way up to the neck. So you get uh, this mixed up. Let, 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 Go ahead. Let's, well, I was going to let's, let's back up to the honey for a minute. Uh, when you when you add the honey to the bucket, um, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of there are a lot of uh, websites out there that, that people go to, and I'm going to keep harping on this, uh, you know, during our shows when, when we talk about it because there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, Chris, you don't heat the honey up at all, do? You? I don't heat it for the purpose of sterilizing it. Uh, now, if it's if you're working in a, a cold environment, there's nothing wrong with setting the uh, the container of honey down into a, a bucket of you know hot water. Uh, yeah. But that's only to loosen it up so that you can get it all out of the jug. Right. Um, there, there's absolutely no reason to heat it. We're not making beer. We're not, you know, we don't need to sanitize honey. Honey is, uh, is pretty much sterile as it is. Well, and what part. happens, uh, what happens when you heat honey up beyond a certain point, beyond a certain temperature, it, it, it really does something to the aroma and to the flavor and, uh, it can have an effect on the outcome as well. Yeah, you'll lose uh, uh, the the subtleties of it. Uh, it's and it's these little subtle differences that make all these varieties of honey different. And so, if you heat it up, uh, you're just you're going to lose all those subtle aromas and aromatics. And uh, so, we want to keep those. Uh, but there's nothing wrong with setting the container of honey down into some hot water just to loosen it up so that it pours easily. Uh, but it doesn't really need to be over, you know, 80, 85 degrees or something like that. Yeah. Um, so, so we don't heat the honey. This, you always might hear this referred to as a no heat method. Right. Uh, so we've got our, uh, we've got our honey and water mixed up. We've got somewhere around five and a half gallons. We're looking at a gravity of 1134. Um, uh, you know, eleven thirty, eleven thirty four, anywhere in that area is is good. Um and so now we're ready to rehydrate the yeast. And uh do you want me to explain that or you Aaron or Jeff you wanna go through that process? Yeah, Aaron uh Aaron, Aaron you got some pretty concise notes in here. Why don't you pick it up from there and uh run us through the the rehydration process, which is kind of important because, I mean, a lot of people out there, again, I mean, so there's a lot of misinformation out there, uh, people just, you know, tossing the yeast on top of their must in their five-gallon bucket and hoping for the best. I, you know, it, it may work, uh, but, you know, whether it's right or wrong, it's not up to me to say, but uh, I just think making a starter, rehydrating it uh, according to the manufacturer's instructions, but to go ahead, Eric. Absolutely. I think it's all about just kind of gently waking that yeast up and, and rehydrating it to kind of bring it back to life there so that it can kick off to a nice, healthy fermentation. Yeah. So, you know, from here, kind of the next steps would be to heat up about one cup of water, about 250 grams, um, just the hotter the better is typically the the approach that I've taken. And, and I'll preface this by saying from here on out, a lot of the, the instructions that I've, I've taken here are um, from Sergio's website, meadmaderight.com. Um, definitely a, a great resource with some, some really good instructions that has yielded some, some pretty favorable results for me um, in the last few batches I've worked with. So 
heating up that you know that one cup of water from there, um, the first thing that we'll want to do is add in 12 and a half grams of go firm to the hot water. Um, I'm also going to kind of bounce around back to Chris, your um, instructions that you had here too. Um, so at that point, you want to dissolve it completely into that hot water and let it cool to 104 degrees Fahrenheit, at which point, um, Chris, I, I saw you had, you've had recommended kind of pouring that hot water gopher mixture into a large like glass casserole dish. And I think the reason for that, and, and it's kind of interesting, it's something I haven't really seen in the past, but the, the reason for that is um, it allows more surface area for a more even rehydration of the yeast, you know, rather than sprinkling that yeast up in kind of a narrow topped vessel or glass or something like that, where it might get all clumped up, you can just really evenly sprinkle it out um, into that larger container like that. Um, from that point it on... Prevent, it prevent- the yeast from clumping up. That's yeah. right. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and this is another interesting thing too: is um, once you sprinkle that yeast on, um, you're you're saying don't stir it. Is there any reason for that? Uh, let it take on the water as it wants to. Uh, that way, you know, you're not forcing it to rehydrate. Just let it uh, let it take it on as it wants to. Okay. Uh, kind of a natural rehydration. Yeah, just sprinkle it on top and and leave it alone. And, and by the way, this is uh, the recipe is on our website, themeathouse.com. It's called Sweet Mead Recipe. It's right there at the top of the page. Uh, if you want to go there and uh, you can download it, copy it, whatever you need to do. Uh, also, we're using the seventy one B yeast, and we're using ten grams. Or two five. Uh, usually, that yeast comes in five gram packages, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah. So that's correct. Yep. Uh, and and I will just throw in one one little note here. Uh, the the manufacturer suggests that the water be 110 degrees when you add the go firm. Uh, I've also seen other places where people said, uh, you know, the hotter the better, but uh, the only thing that I can figure out that the reason Lauvin uh, says 110 degrees is because there are some amino acids and proteins that are in GoFirm, and uh, amino acids at certain temperatures can denature. And what happens when, a, when an amino acid or a protein denatures, it becomes more difficult to assimilate. Uh, we as humans, we can uh, we can assimilate it because we have very complex digestive systems that can break it down. Uh, that's the reason we can cook an egg well done and eat it, and we still get the benefit of the protein. But <clears throat> organisms like yeast, they don't have that complex uh, digestive system like we do. They may not be able to use amino acids that have been denatured. Uh, I don't know exactly what the temperature is that requires an amino acid to reach to denature it, but that's that's the only reason I can think of why they suggest 110 degrees is to prevent that from happening. Uh, because, you know, the vitamins and minerals that are in there, they should be stable well above that. So that only leaves the amino acids to worry about. So a little technical technical information there. Well, and I think uh, you know, for lack of uh, anything else, I mean, if you if you're really not sure, follow the manufacturer's suggested uh, method of rehydration. It's on the back package of you know virtually every package of yeast you buy, or you can go to the uh, uh, you know the manufacturer's website and uh, you know the, get the information there as well. One, one important thing about the water, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on when we talk about stuck fermentation, is you don't want to boil your water. Because if you do that, you boil the oxygen out of the water, and the yeast will really, really struggle uh, to get uh, to get started and, and even survive a, a rehydration at that point. So. Mm-hmm. 
true. But thing. after uh, now, you know, we're looking at uh, we're looking at this GoFirm product. Uh, this is a this is a nutrient that's specifically used for yeast rehydration. Correct. This is, Aaron, this is yours. Yeah, I, I believe so. Um, that yeah. the uh, the instructions that I have on on the package, I actually have like a Go Firm Energy, and it says it's like a complex blend of yeast nutrients, like you're saying, just specifically designed to you know bring that yeast back to a, a rehydrated state. I, you know, I think in other places it's called Go Firm Protect. I, I've heard it called different things: Go Firm, Go Firm Protect. Maybe that's what my yeah. is the Go Firm Protect. It, yeah. The Go Firm Protect is uh, is suitable more for higher gravity uh, needs. It, there's a little difference, and I'm not sure exactly what it is, but uh, the Go Firm either one will work fine for this. Uh, if once we get into talking about some higher gravity starts, you're probably going to want the Go Firm Protect. But either one will work for this. So we're uh, we're at this point. Um, we've mixed uh, roughly twenty pounds of honey, uh, and we've brought our water up to about the five and a half gallon mark. Now it's uh, you know you want to have a little bit of extra honey because to get you know and, and you're not looking for specifically five and a half gallons. You're looking specifically for a gravity point of at least 1.13034 is better for this recipe. So, and I think that's pretty important to note here. Uh, whether it's five and three quarter gallons or just under five and a half gallons, uh, when you're mixing your honey, I always hold a little bit back. I run my water in and then I fine tune the, the batch until I get to my desired amount, which is usually five and a half gallons, and my specific gravity. So you just, you know, you're adding water, adding honey, adding water, adding honey, until you get to a point where you're comfortable with the with the gravity. Um, yeah, just make sure that, that everything is mixed thoroughly and dissolved. Otherwise, you will not get a, a, a true gravity reading. You know, and one thing about, you know, for, for people who are doing this for the first time, uh, you know, to start out, you can go to any brew shop and you can buy a kit uh, that comes, you, you know, you get your fermentation bucket, you get a glass carboy, you get the racking cane. Uh, various pieces of equipment, hydrometers. That's a pretty good, pretty good way to start out. And these kits, that, mm-hmm. I've seen them run anywhere from a hundred bucks to even a hundred and twenty bucks. Uh, you know, rather, rather inexpensive, really. Uh, you know, to and, start and, out. So, and since let, let me just say one other thing before Aaron goes back to his rehydration. Um, on this mixing of the water and honey, I've made this recipe so many times I can tell you that if if uh, if you put in 20 pounds of orange blossom honey and then you mix, you pour in water until you reach the five and a half gallon mark, you're going to be good. Yeah, I can yeah. I can tell you right now you're going to be good on the gravity. So uh, if you want to just keep it simple. Uh, let's just keep it simple. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I think I think it's a good point. And to me, that was kind of a turning point for me when you know a lot of these recipes that you go out to the local homebrew supply shop and, and it just tells you mix in fifteen pounds of honey with you know, four and a half gallons of water to get to five total gallons, and it's more just telling you the the amount of honey and the amount of water. To me, that kind of would lead to, you know, sometimes inconsistent results in the final gravity. And, you know, by by structuring your recipe around what your original gravity is and then, you know, taking into account the alcohol tolerance of the yeast that you're using and kind of tailoring or, or kind of setting your target final gravity based on that, I think that's a, a really good way to go. But, you know, for the beginners out there just getting started, just get the 20 pounds of honey, top it up to five and a half gallons, and you'll be good to go. Yeah, yeah, you, you, should, be right, you should be looking at about 1134 if you do that. Uh, you may be a point or two 
up or down, but you're going to be close enough for this recipe. You'll be in the neighborhood, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So I think from there, you know, we left off, we had sprinkled our yeast into this kind of a wide glass casserole dish to allow for that even surface area and to allow the, the yeast to kind of take on the water as it, as it needs it. Um, from there, this, this is another kind of key point here is to let it sit for about 20 minutes. And, um, Chris, I noticed you suggested placing that casserole dish in like a microwave or other kind of dark secluded place where it's you know it's warm it's dark and you don't run that risk of having any other debris or anything falling into it yeah i have a cat that likes to jump on everything and uh (laughs) so that doesn't mix well (laughs) i could see that yeah that that might be a bad situation there um so so after about 20 minutes, you know, you want to kind of gently stir it with a sanitized spoon kind of slowly. And at that point, you want to start tempering that yeast slurry by adding small amounts of your honey must back to the yeast slurry to kind of slowly bring that temperature down. Um, you know, I, I think you don't want to rush this process. So add in some of the honey must and take a temperature reading. If you're not quite within, you know, 10 degrees of the must temperature, let it sit for for another half hour and just take your time with that process. Um, once I started doing this, it, it really made a big difference. Um, one of the, the last patches that I did, like the, the yeast slurry was starting to, you know, foam up and, and bubble and sizzle a little bit there um, before I, I pitched it into the batch. And, and I think that just comes from tempering with small amounts of the honey must and just slowly letting it come to, to temperature, um, to that temperature range. Once you do reach that point where you're within 10 degrees, then you're ready to go ahead and, and pitch that yeast slurry into the must. Um, and, and by doing that, you're also avoiding temperature shock of you know too rapidly decreasing that temperature which can undo all of the the good that you just did by carefully going through that rehydration procedure mm-hmm. and it's a good idea also uh, you got your leaves stir that you mixed up your honey and water and by the way for the beginners out there once you mix your honey and water together it's called a must and uh, before you pour the yeast in, it's a good idea to hit that again with your with your stirrer uh, to kind of whip some oxygen into that honey and water mixture. Uh, that's going to help the yeast uh, to have that oxygen in there. So uh, hit it with your drill, uh, stir your lead stir, and then take your drill out and then pour your yeast in. Yeah. All right, so a uh, quick recap here. We've mixed 20, uh, 20 pounds of honey, orange blossom honey, uh, with uh, approximately five and a half gallons of water. We brought the gravity up to about 1.134 or so. Uh, we've rehydrated our 71B, Lalvin 71B, that's 10 grams of, of 71B yeast with uh, 12.5 grams of go firm at 104 degrees. Uh, we've added back uh, a little bit of must to temper the yeast slurry uh, to bring it within 10 degrees of the temperature of your must. Uh, and your ambient temperature should be somewhere around 70, 72, 74 degrees, I would think. And yes. Yeah. So, and then we uh, and then we uh, pitch the yeast. Uh, you stir it into your must. And at this point, uh, what's next, guys? Um, Jeff, you want to go from there or you want me to do it? Well, sure, I can take it from here. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is hang out for a little while. We're going to wait for some signs of activity, and we're going to wait for the, the yeast to start building. Usually that should happen within about 24 hours. Um, sometimes it takes a little longer, and that's fine if it does. Um, and once we get some, some signs of activity, we can start talking about nutrients. Um, so, so, Jeff, real quick, would this be a good time to crack open a bottle of mead to drink? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is there a bad time to crack open a bottle of meat to drink? <laughs> well said, well said. Yeah. 
Very good, very good. Uh, now I don't have the all the show notes in front of me, so the exact amounts are escaping me at the moment. Um, but I know we're going to split this into um, four different patches. We're going to add um, the first patch about, and if I remember correctly, these are about uh, one quarter of the total amount each. Um, yeah, it's uh, uh, the, uh, the the blend, the nutrient blend is. Uh, Two teaspoons of DAP, diammonium phosphate, and one teaspoon of Fermade K. We're going to mix those three teaspoons together in a container thoroughly, and uh, we'll use three quarters of a teaspoon per addition. So that would be, uh, you can mix that up ahead of time, put it in a, a small jelly jar, mason jar, uh, yeah, you know, something. I use an old medicine bottle or something. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Jeff. So anyway, uh, we're going to add that first addition about 24 hours into the ferment. Um, usually, the way I like to do this is to to pour off um, around about a cup of the must um, and just mix it in slowly. You're going to expect this to foam. Um, more than a little bit, so you really want a larger container than a cup measure. I found that's not the hard way. Uh, the uh, yeah. the um, the additions have uh, a lot of surface area that all that uh, dissolved carbon dioxide from the fermentation is going to kind of like glom onto and release from. So you you get a little bit of a foam explosion. But the reason we're doing this in the cup is so that this happens in the mixing cup and not in your ferment uh, fermenting tank by itself. Um, so yeah, you want to get that nicely mixed up. Um, you add that back into the, uh, the must. And then generally, um, I like to degas, uh, before I add. It helps get rid of some of that carbon dioxide and, um, prevents nasty foam ups from being really bad. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've been there and done that before too. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Good, another good reason not to ferment in a carboy, yeah, unless you want meat on the ceiling. Yeah. <laughs> Been there. Yeah, reserve the, reserve the carboys for secondary ferment only. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, right, so we want to follow the, the degassing regimen and uh, nutrient additions, and the next addition is going to come at 48 hours and then 72 hours. Uh, the way I usually do it, and I don't know if this is per the recipe uh, or if the recipe is just another day after that, but I usually go about the one-third sugar break, which is it's either another day or another two days uh, most of the time. But that, that one-third sugar break is a terminology meaning um, one-third of the available sugars have been fermented. Um, so if you look at... Um, look at a, a, a hydrometer reading. In this case, we'd be talking, oh, and I'm trying to math the top of my head, um, uh, in the, the neighborhood of uh, 1065, if I'm not mistaken. No, no. 480, uh, 1084, yeah, something like that, 10, 1085, yeah. For, for the purpose of for the purpose of this recipe, I had to I just did four additions, uh, twenty four hours apart. Uh, you're going to be close enough; it'll work fine that way for the yeah. beginner uh, without having to calculate the one third sugar break. Uh, just do it for four days in a row, twenty four hours apart. Yeah. Okay, and then. Uh so we're at four days later. Here we are. We've got our uh, nutrients all mixed in, and uh, you know, uh, like uh, like Aaron said, now would be a good time to crack o- crack open another bottle of mead <laughs> because you've got uh, you've got a significant weight on your hands. That doesn't mean to say that we're you know you're you're not without something to do. There's still some maintenance, some management that you still need to tend to. You know, during this process, um, yeah, you know, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna degas uh, twice a day for the first seven days, and you're gonna use your your drill mounted lead stir to do that, and uh, you're gonna do it once in the morning and once in the evening, and one of those times each day is gonna be when you add your nutrients in, 
but I think I made a note uh, in the recipe, do this twice a day only, no more. Um, we want this meat to finish sweet, and we don't want it to be overly alcoholic. Uh, you're going to end up somewhere in the neighborhood of a 14% alcohol mead with this recipe. If you start to degas more and you're getting in a hurry, you think it's not going fast enough or something, you're just going to, you're going to cause that yeast to just way overshoot, uh, where you want to be. So do it two times a day, uh, for the first seven days. The first four days, there's going to be a nutrient addition with one of those uh, degassings. And uh, another important part of this recipe, if you notice in the instructions, uh, you cover this with uh, a towel and just put a rubber band around it. Uh, do not put a lid on it until you do your final degassing. Uh, when you do your final degassing, you're going to put your, your airlock on, your, your lid with your airlock. Uh, but those first seven days are going to be with a towel only. Now, if you guys remember, last week I told you we were going to talk about some uh, oxidative and reductive ferments. Right. Well, this is going to follow this, this particular mead. We haven't gotten into that yet, but just for people wondering, this is going to fall into the uh, more of the oxidative ferments because we're leaving the top where it can just fully breathe. We've got uh, a piece of cloth or a towel or something over the top to keep out the bugs and fruit flies, but we're not putting it under airlock until day number eight. Yeah. So uh, we'll get into the reasons for that later on in another show, but... Uh, just cover it with a towel until you get through degassing. And again, this recipe, uh, you can download, copy, paste, whatever you need to do. This recipe is on our website, themeathouse.com. Uh, just look for Sweet Mead Recipe uh, and uh, take the notes uh, and uh, and get it started. Uh, you can get all of this uh, all everything in this recipe is pretty readily available. Uh, orange blossom honey is a very common honey you can find just about anywhere. Uh, you know your local brew shop should have seventy one B. That's a very common yeast that's used by Lalvin. Uh, they should also have the the nutrients. Now there may be an issue trying to find the Go Firm Protect uh, and the uh, uh, Firm Aid K. Uh, jump on uh, Amazon.com or a place, uh, another good place, uh, another shameless plug. We, we don't do any advertising on our show, but hey, you know what? Resources are resources. Another great place to get uh, uh, equipment and, 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 and things that you need for doing this is morebeer.com or morewine.com, basically the same place. I know that they carry the Firm AK brand and, and the uh, – uh, and the go firm as well, but uh, if you can't find, yeah, it there, I get all, Go ahead. I, I get almost everything from More Beer. Yeah, uh, morebeer dot com has got just about everything you need. Yeah, uh, and and also JD, if uh, if we, I try, I think we covered everything in the instructions as best as I can remember. But if if anyone has any questions about it, they can always go to themeathouse.com the and look up the contact us button and send us your questions and we can, we can try to straighten them out. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, this, this recipe is meant to be a very simple uh, first time out. If you've never made bead uh, before, uh, you know, this is, this is a very simple process, very simple recipe. Uh, and... Uh, you know, it, it would probably take you less than an hour to put the whole thing together. Uh, you know, the, I guess the the wait time would be waiting on the yeast to rehydrate. Uh, actually, that would be the longest period of time involved. But uh, and like Chris said, this is uh, this is going to generate a sweet mead uh, around fourteen percent. Uh, you know, so. Uh, Sounds like a good recipe. Sounds like something I might even do. <laughs> it's going to come down. Uh, it's going to finish out 
probably around, oh, uh, I've had it stop at 1030, and I've had it go as low as 1024, uh, which is still, uh, any of that is a good range. Yeah. Uh, but, but you're going to leave this once, once you put the airlock on it, you're going to do no more stirring, no more degassing. You're just going to let it sit, uh, for an additional two weeks. So you're going to be looking at 21 days from the day you pitch the yeast. Uh, at 21 days, it should be finished by that time it, yeah. or very, very, very close to it. And then you're going to siphon, which we call racking. Uh, you're gonna, you're gonna need a racking cane to do that. And if you go to your homebrew supply or websites, you can find those. They're easy to operate, self-explanatory. The main thing here is that, uh, you're gonna siphon this into a five gallon carboy and you want to leave behind the sediment that's gonna be in your bucket. So, uh, that's the purpose of having the five and a half gallons because you want to have enough so that you don't have to put your racking cane all the way down in the bottom. So you want to avoid that sediment and you're going to rack it into your five gallon carboy. You're going to take one vanilla bean, you cut it up into about one inch pieces or so, drop it in, leave it for about two to three weeks. After about three weeks, you're going to siphon that into another five-gallon carboy, leaving behind the vanilla bean and any additional sediment. Put an airlock on it and forget about it for a while. And, a and while, your work is done. A while could be several months. Using using this this particular nutrient regimen with the the DAP and the Fermade K, you're probably going to be looking at uh, around six months before you're really going to enjoy it. Maybe even a little bit longer. Yeah. Uh, Aaron has so graciously done the math already for using Fermade O. If you prefer to use the Tosna approach. Uh, and I think we're going to post that up as an alternative to the uh, nutrient regimen that I had had posted along with the recipe. Yes. So uh, if we get that posted up, you know, it's up to you. It's your choice which you want to do. Uh, the reason I chose to use the DAP and Fermade K in this example is because it's, I guess it's what most people sort of consider the standard way to go. Um in my experience, and I believe in all of you guys too, the, the Tosna or, or even just a Firm Aid K approach by itself, uh, makes a much faster drinking mead. Um, but, uh, you know, that's up to you. We, we just wanted to give you some options. And, uh, so Aaron has done the math on the, on the Firm Aid O if you, if you choose to use that. But if you do use a Firm Aid O, Let's make it clear, you're not going to use the DAP and Firm AK at the same time. So to uh, to answer Scott Monroe's question, I know he's listening in tonight. He just uh, put up a question on the Facebook page. Uh, he wanted to know how soon this is going to be drinkable. And uh, so, Scott, we're looking, we're looking, a, you know, realistically, we're looking at probably somewhere around six to eight months. Uh, before you can go ahead and bottle this up and and begin to enjoy it, longer is is usually better. Uh, and in subsequent shows that we do here on the Mead House, we'll be talking about some more recipes. Uh, some recipes, uh, you know, that'll put you in a bottle and have you drinking it, uh, you know, in about three months. Uh, so, uh, you know, look forward to that. But to this particular recipe. You know, you're probably looking at anywhere between six and eight months before you can really actually enjoy it. So, it depends on how much of an alcoholic you are. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you you can drink it right out of the primary bucket if if you really want to. But now, if we're talking about how long before you enjoy it, then probably a little bit longer. Um, 
Uh, another thing that we, we did forget one thing, uh, this needs to ferment at about 62 degrees. And yeah. that's probably going to be the biggest issue for new mead makers because they're not going to have a way uh, to accurately control the temperature. Uh, it's going to depend on how, how warm the room is, that where your bucket is sitting and all this kind of stuff. But you need to be around 62 degrees if you can. Um, what I would suggest for beginners, if you don't have a way to control it accurately, set your bucket into a shallow pan, put water in it, and wrap an old T-shirt around your bucket. And let that T-shirt um, hang down in the water and maybe put a fan on it or something. Uh, you would be surprised how much you, you can drop the temperature by uh, 10 degrees easily by doing that. Yeah, that so evaporative kind of, cooling effect, absolutely. That's when I used to brew beer down in, in Florida before I moved to Wisconsin. That's an old trick I used to use. The, yeah, the wet, wet towel, uh, wet T-shirt, and the, the fan on it, too. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a rough and ready way to do it, but, hey, uh, I've made some pretty good meat like that, so. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. What, um, when we, uh, you know, we, we were talking, uh, you know, getting this recipe started, uh, you know, we've got it, uh, in the bucket it's fermenting and, and then you wake up one day and there's no movement in the airlock and we're like uh, you know maybe 32 hours uh, into this thing uh, or less uh, you know when we went to bed the night before I mean it, you know it was, it was churning away just uh, just fine bubbling away and then, and then suddenly it just came to a stop uh, and uh, this is the second uh, half of the show here tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about stuck fermentations and, uh, you know, how to recognize them, what do you do about it, and even, you know, I guess we could go into how to prevent them as well. But before we get to that, Aaron, can you quickly take us through the Tozna approach uh, as an alternative to the nutrient feedings for this sweet mead uh, project? Absolutely. So as, as I think, think Jeff and, and Chris were indicating, with this DAP and Fermade K approach, essentially it's a mixture of two teaspoons DAP and one teaspoon Fermade K. Those three teaspoons get mixed together and then added as a staggered nutrient addition after 24, 48, 72 hours, and then another one either – you know, on on the fourth day, or for the more advanced mead maker, um, at the one third sugar break. For the Tasna approach, essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to replace that Fermade K and DAP mixture with Fermade O. And um, this is another one where you know the the local homebrew supply shop nearby may not carry Fermade O. So the the morebeer.com and, and Amazon, that's how I've procured mine, was was just through Amazon, uh, may be a good way to, to get this. But um, essentially what, um, what Sergio Mutella on his website recommends is getting yourself a nice gram scale to be able to measure out the weight of nutrient additions. Um, he's got some, some calculations. Maybe on a future show we'll get into uh, exactly what goes into those calculations. But based on this batch size and starting gravity of 1134, um, each of these nutrient additions would be about 11.2 five grams of fermade O. So the essentially if I can the same here. Go for uh, it. Yeah. Speaking of procuring things on Amazon, um, the gram scale could be had really cheap on Amazon. I picked one up for about I think seven dollars. So the the idea of buying extra equipment shouldn't be a barrier to doing the toast nut at all. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That you know, that's just a, a key point as well for me is you know, honey is just so gosh darned expensive. And if you're gonna invest all that money in good quality honey, you know, get yourself the seven dollar gram scale and, and invest in that because it, it'll help, you know, make all the difference for your meads. Exactly. Yeah. 
So, we, yeah, that's that's basically the the Tozna method right there. Um, the, the same type of a thing. After twenty four hours, uh, forty eight and seventy two, you would just draw out a small amount of must, maybe one cup or so. Mix in that Fermaid O. Um, one of the the things I've noticed when using Fermaid O is that it, it doesn't necessarily bubble up quite as much as the the Fermaid K and the DAP mixture, but it definitely clumps up real bad and kind of makes these little little fermate o dough balls. So, um, you know, it, it takes some effort to kind of break those apart and make sure that the nutrients is evenly mixed into that must before you, you know, reintroduce it back into your um, your primary fermenter. Maybe maybe throw in a blender, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that that probably speaking, do of, uh, speaking of uh, procuring more equipment, uh, I mentioned that lee stir that mounts in a drill. Uh, if you're, you know, if you have any doubts about it, let me tell you now, get the lee stir. They're, they're a little bit expensive. They're kind of pricey. They're 24, 25 bucks for what seems like something that's real simple. Uh, if you try to do this, you know, you can mix the honey and water with a, with a long handled stainless steel spoon. Uh, and about one minute into the process, you're going to be slapping yourself in the face going, why didn't I buy the Lee Stir? Yep. <laughs> Definitely. So, uh, That'll make yeah. life a lot easier. Yeah. And it's one of those tools that once you got it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're going to be using it to be gas twice a day and, uh, uh, trust me, get get the Lee Stir. Spend the 25 bucks and get a Lee Stir. If you don't have a drill, borrow one from your neighbor. But get the Lee Stir. Don't, don't try to do without it. it you're, it's just going to save you so much headache. Uh, even if this is the only batch of mead you ever make, um, buy it and then give it to someone else who wants to make mead if you don't want to use it anymore. Yeah, good point. <laughs> Good point. And you know, I uh, when I first started out, I just I just absolutely refused to pay the. Actually, I think it was more around the line of thirty bucks for that damn leaster. So I went down to the hardware store and I bought an anodized uh, paint bucket stirrer, and uh, that's what I started out. It works just fine. Uh, mm-hmm. They're a little on the heavy side, though. Uh, you, you know, you hook it up to the drill and and get to stirring around. It's, yeah, you know, it, it takes a little bit of work to keep it off. You want to keep it off the sides of your bucket for sure because uh, mm-hmm. you don't want to mark up the sides of the bucket. But it did get a little heavy, and I finally broke down and bought, a, I bought one of those Lee Stirs, and I'm kind of glad I did. So it's a good investment. So uh, Yeah, the Lee Stir, they have the little plastic wings on them uh, so they don't, they don't uh, scar your bucket up. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, and another thing too is later on when we start getting into degassing our our finished meads, uh, they will fit down into a carboy. So that's yeah. another good thing. Yeah, where a paint stirrer won't. Uh, yeah, yeah, because when I got to that point, I thought, okay, now what? And that's when I had to break down and finally buy the leaf stirrer. So. Yeah. So now we're now we're we're twenty four hours, maybe thirty hours into this, and you know we were chugging along just fine, and then suddenly everything just kind of ground to a halt, and uh, no activity. Uh, now, even by this point, uh, let's say it's after the seven days, you've taken the towel off, put the lid on with the airlock. You know, you go to bed that night, and you know the bubbler's just churning away, looking good. And you get up in the morning, and you know you might get a couple bubbles uh, every couple of hours, or maybe none at all, even. So now what? Uh, and we call that a stuck fermentation, right, guys? First thing to do is check the airlock and make sure that it's sealing good. You might check your lid. Uh, because the airlock activity, if there's none, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not fermented. Uh, so make sure, first of all, before you panic, that you've got a good seal. Yeah. Yeah, that's, you know, first steps. Uh, and there, there, there are several reasons why, 
it may have gotten to this point. And it even starts in the very beginning when you rehydrated the yeast. Uh, remember I said something about not using boiled water. If you boil the water, <clears throat> if you boil the water, you boil the oxygen out and the yeast really struggles to get a good start. Now, it may look good when you go to pitch it, but it's really got to work overtime to, you know, to get things going and start munching on all that honey. Uh, the other yeah. thing that uh, might affect it is temperature. Uh, I found that out the hard way, uh, you know, in one of my early, you know, I couldn't figure out what, you know, what's going on with this. Uh, I followed everybody's directions. Uh, my mentor, uh, uh, Pete Bokulich, uh, uh you know, uh, uh, was helping me along with it. And, and suddenly it just, it just ground to a halt. And it's like, okay, well, you know, I, I, I spent all this money on, on stainless steel fermenters, all this honey and everything, and nothing's working. And it turned out it was temperature, uh, you know, which is probably, I don't know, Chris, or uh, you guys, I mean, would temperature be maybe the number one culprit, do you think? I think it depends on how far along in the ferment you are. Uh, you, you can never really completely rule something out, but, uh, yeah. you know, like uh, some of the things that can cause uh, a stuck ferment are the temperature is too low or too high, usually too low. Uh, the pH is too low. Um, yeah. There, there's there's a lot of things that can that can cause it. Uh, what I have found in my experience, if you're going to have a problem with pH dropping too low, it almost always has happened to me in the, in the first two to three days. Uh, mm. I the, the pH seems to level out somewhat after about the third day. So if you don't stall because of a pH problem in the first two or three days, you're probably not looking at a pH problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you have to start looking at other things at that point. If it's, uh, if it's later in the ferment, um, you're probably looking more toward temperature. Um, Another thing you might want to do is just take a gravity reading and see where you're at because, right. hey, I mean, just because we say something's going to take three weeks to ferment, uh, you know, sometimes those yeast can really, they, they just turn into Superman and you could be seven days into the ferment and it may be done. Right. You may not be stuck. It may just be finished. Uh, yeah. I've had me, I've had needs to drop. 30 gravity points every 24 hours and you know it's going to finish up quick like that so yeah, um, yeah that's check really gravity. rapid yeah, yeah. well uh, that, I, that's not normal but it does happen so yeah I think, uh, you know along the lines of temperature uh, and this is a lesson and this is why we do this show is to hopefully prevent and you know our tagline let us throw the honey out for you um, you know we've been there and done that uh, all of us here so we're, we're trying to prevent uh, the folks that are listening or you know live or, or later on from maybe you know having the same mistakes that you know we've already been through Temperature for me was a big deal, and this is what prompted me to actually, you know, get involved with the stainless steel fermenters. And uh, I've got a chiller, uh, you know, an immersion chiller that works very, very efficiently. Uh, and uh, some Rube Goldberg projects that you know we'll talk about on future shows too. But uh, temperature—it's important to note here that during the fermentation process. You know your ambient temperature. Let's say you, you're you're fermenting in a in a bedroom uh, that might be 70 degrees, or in a basement that's 65 degrees. The temperature of the must is probably maybe even 10 degrees higher uh, because the act of fermentation actually increases the temperature inside your container, inside your your uh, you know fermenting bucket container. So. Uh, and that's was it, was, it, was it Jeff or Aaron who had the uh, the stories about the 
stress yeah. on that. <laughs> yeah, Jeff got. Uh, in fact, let's turn it over to Jeff. He's got. He's got some pretty good. Uh, pretty good stories here about about this. So, uh, Jeff, uh, talk to us, bud. Oh sure. So when I was putting this together and I was thinking about all the the really frustrating stuck fermentations, I decided to call this a history of bad decisions because I, I pretty much figured out how to deal with these or um, how I got to these situations because I made some really dumb moves learning how to do this. And I think uh, this is right along the idea of let us throw that out for you because, oh, my God. Um, the, one of the first the first mistake I made in my second batch, um, I had uh, – with the the kit that I got from the homebrew store for making you know wine and meat, I had these little cannon tablets, and the the instructions on the package indicated, oh yeah, you can use these to prevent oxidization when you're degassing, not not degassing, when you're racking into a secondary container. Um, so when I got around to doing the the, the rack to secondary, I I ground up I think three of those little guys and put them in the back to the bottom of the the carboy and racked onto that. Um, <laughs> That ended up completely stunning and, and basically killing the mead. Um, but I let it sit for a, a few days, kind of like, well, are you going to do something? Um, anything? You know, I tried to, tried to kick it with a little extra nutrient, seeing if that did anything, and it didn't. And finally, I ended up having to repitch, and everything turned out okay. Uh, but, yeah, no, the, um, that was kind of mistake number one and it was only my second batch out <laughs> um, oh. contrary to Chris's experience though I found that I have uh, a number of pH um, drops um, later in fermentation uh, I want to say typically two or three weeks in um, is, is where I've seen a couple of them um, one of them happened with uh, with a high gravity meat that I was trying and um, at, at this, this point in time, I wasn't doing any kind of a, a staggered nutrient addition. I was just kind of dumping everything into the start, and I wasn't degassing um, hardly at all. Uh, so the, the meat was probably running pretty hot. Um, I, I, I know uh, you can get uh, a buildup of acids uh, from fermentation and, and things like that, and that's not uncommon, I believe, for uh, for hotter fermentations to throw some of those along with a few sloth holes and other kind of stuff we're trying to avoid. Um, and I, I assume that's what happened here. But um, in this case, I got a little bit of that calcium carbonate from the, the homebrew store and use it really sparingly a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time, and I finally got that restarted. And I think I ended up repitching too, uh, just because it wasn't really churning through. And the, the calcium carbonate seemed to do the trick, but um, then the next time that happened to me, I was making a, a hibiscus mead, um, and that the calcium carbonate, maybe I wasn't as careful with it, but it ended up leaving a really chalky residue taste um, in, in the meat that just, yeah, yeah it, it killed all the enjoyment. <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I was trying to let it settle out, and I was trying to let it relax, and that it just kind of you know, settle down to the bottom with the leaves and um, settle out. But then the, the recipe ended up oxidizing anyway, and we had to throw it out. So that is one of the few batches that I've had to just get rid of entirely. Yeah. Now, did you um, say you were using calcium carbonate or potassium carbonate? Calcium carbonate is what I got from the homebrew store, and I do understand uh, from from what I've heard lately, um, you do get better results with uh, potassium bicarbonate, if I'm not mistaken. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, calcium carbonate is what I got from the homebrew store, so it's what I use. Mm -hmm. That's probably where your chalky taste came from. Was the, the calcium? I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, so a, <laughs> does the the potassium bicarbonate? Does it, Jeff? From what you've heard, it, it doesn't necessarily impart such a chalky off flavor. That's that's my understanding. I have no actual experience of it with myself. Um, okay. Interesting. So, I've only I've only used it one time, and and that was potassium. Uh, well, there's potassium carbonate, potassium bicarbonate. 
you can use either one. Uh, I think what I used was potassium carbonate. And uh, like I said, I've only used it one time, and uh, I, I didn't notice any flavor impact at all from it uh, other than reduced acidity. Gotcha. Yeah, I, <laughs> kind of a funny story. I went and bought, looking at the package here, one pound of potassium bicarbonate and have never used it, never needed to use it, so it's still sitting here in the package sealed up. <laughs> How many yeah. of them starting out with me? You know, you, uh, and I, I, you know, I think I wrote about it on the website about my, you know, when I first started doing this. You know, my trip to the homebrew store, I'm, I'm standing in this place just bewildered. <laughs> you know, and I'm looking at all this stuff. None of it makes any sense to me whatsoever. And, you know, the guy walks up, you know, kind of help you. And I says, well, you know, I'm, I'm trying to act like I'm informed. And it's like, yeah, I'm going to make, uh, I, I make mead. So I need, I need equipment. Well, what do you need? And I said, well, everything. So I, I came home with I got a shelf of chemicals here that would outfit a science lab very nicely. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Stuff I that yeah and, use. <laughs> and and we're talking about uh, accumulating equipment. Uh, a pH meter is one of those things that you look at and you look at the price tag and you go, yeah, I, I can get by without that for now. Uh, and you just don't need a pH meter until you need one. And yep. then, and then you wish, then you, some, when something goes wrong, then you're, you're scratching your head and you have no way to know. Uh, so, you know, hopefully if everything goes right, you, you never need this stuff, but when you need it, you need it. And, uh, it, it, this is a hobby. I mean, let's face it, you're going to spend money on hobbies, uh, no matter what you do. And there's a lot more expensive hobbies than meat making. Sure. Uh, so, you know, you're talking about 15, 16 bucks for a fermentation bucket. Uh, what, what's a hydrometer going for now? About seven bucks. Seven, eight bucks. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, seven, eight bucks. You get a, a gram scale that's accurate down to a tenth of a gram for like seven or eight bucks. Uh, a rack and cane is 15. Lee stir is 25. Uh, cardboard is about 35. Uh, pH meter, you can get a decent one for what, about 75 bucks or so. Oh, the one I used was uh, like 15 bucks off of Amazon. I gotta calibrate the damn thing every time I use it, but hey, you know it works. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're you're the one for mine, and I, I have to calibrate it every time too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Probably a good idea, but but the point is, you know, you're looking at uh, you know two fifty, three hundred bucks to really get outfitted, yeah. and and then there's other things that we're going to talk about later that that you're gonna probably want to get at a later time but if you're starting out uh you're, you're going to spend two to three hundred bucks on equipment uh but Jeez. you know you got to remember this is this is a hobby this is something that most of this stuff you're purchasing you can use over and over you never have to buy it again right and uh and so uh, just look at it as an investment and you're going to get a lot of enjoyment from doing this so so don't don't skimp on this stuff because, uh, uh, like I said, you're you're going to be beating yourself over the head when something goes wrong and you don't have a way to find out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean it's an investment. Uh, you know, after making a lot of mistakes in my early batches, uh, you know, the several hundred pounds of honey that that I wasted. Uh, you know, I finally broke down and bought. You know, I spent. Uh, well, roughly 600 bucks on a stainless steel fermenter and an immersion chiller set up and I've invested you know since then with my whole uh, my whole little DIY uh, you know cooling system that I have but um, so yeah you're right Chris I mean it's you know it's a hobby you got to spend some money at this Aaron you got um, or not Aaron Jeff uh, tell us what happened to the wedding mead <laughs> the, the wedding meat obviously was a special batch. I mean, we had 
um, a, a friend of my, a friend of a friend of mine is a beekeeper and um, had, had lost a hive and wound up with about thirty pounds of honey that he was looking to move um, at a pretty decent price. So I jumped on that like a fat kid on a cupcake and got all of it. Um, <laughs> there you go. It, it, because. Because it was a friend of a friend, it was a little bit special, and it was you know really nice, like sure. basic wildflower honey that had been barely filtered. Um, I I didn't want to mess with it, so I decided um, the bulk of it we were going to use for just a nice traditional semi sweet mead for our wedding, um, and the. The fermentation got stuck. I want to say. Um, right around when I was thinking about getting it racked over to secondary, it just kind of stopped on me. And it didn't, it, I, I checked the gravity and it wasn't quite an alcohol tolerance. So, um, I, I kind of said, well, you know, what's wrong with this? And I, t- I checked the pH and it was down around like, Oh, I want to say 2.8. It was really low. Um, I had just had that, that really awful experience with the hibiscus we had to dump out, and so I didn't want to do more of the calcium carbonate and risk making that nasty. Right. But I kind of didn't have much of the choice. Um, so I did a little of that, and um, I, I also didn't want to risk oxidization because that got things really awful. And we were at this point, I want to say about seven weeks away from the wedding, and I needed something to serve. Um yeah. So, we, we, I, uh, I, I, I realized, you know, I need to, to degas it because I had read somewhere, um, the, the dissolved, uh, carbon dioxide can mix with the water to form carbonic acid. And there's, a, there's a chemical equilibrium at place that prevents much of that from happening. But it's enough that it can, uh, if there's a lot of dissolved carbon dioxide, it can persist and it can lower your pH for you. So I knew I had to degas and I had to get more of that out because I, I think I got lazy with degassing early in the process. Um, so I, I was far enough along that I didn't want to risk oxidization. And I, I figured out the best way to do this is to just do it really gently. So I put that leaf stirrer on the drill. Um, I stuck that in there and I just kind of, I let it go just slow enough to, to get some of the bubbles like out of the, the ferment. And I did that several days, um, really gently, really painstakingly. Um, and finally, uh, we, we got to the point where I was, I was ready to, to use some finding agents. And, uh, by the time we were done with the finding agents, that last bit of the calcium carbonate taste had, uh, had filtered out and it wound up being a really good meat that we were happy to present at the wedding. <laughs> Cool. It, it, uh, yeah, I, if I had hair, I would have been pulling it out trying to get it there, but it, it wound up <laughs> great. Yeah, and it's, it's a, it's a pain in the butt when you have to baby, uh, a mead like that, that you know is going to be good, but you have to just coax it into being good just because of, of mistakes, you know, it's, it's really frustrating when you have to do that. But, yeah. Uh, I know, uh, you know, from a personal experience with uh, a project that I started some months back, uh, you got to be really careful with the pH stuff. And there's a point in this mead making where you can get too involved with it and I think that's what happened to me I just you know I read so much about the pH that it turned I was it turned into a real concern and uh, and I really shouldn't uh, have had that kind of concern over this I found out later on that it was really it, it's really not a big deal uh, if you do everything right control your temperatures uh, you know, do your degassing. I mean, this is uh, as much as this is a, a hobby. It, it's also like having a child. I mean, you, you have to maintain it. You got to feed it. You got to babysit it. Uh, you got to take care of it. Uh, you know, if you want to enjoy the end result. Um, yeah, if you if you will sort of take the approach that the yeast or your pets. Uh, while you're making the mead and, and take care of them as such. Uh, and every pet has its own needs and, 
yeast are they're a unique pet, and you got to take care of them. Yeah, it's a good analogy. I know uh, the one, uh, and I'm not going to go into all the detail, but the one project uh, was a pumpkin that I was I really looking forward to uh, next November. And uh, it, it got to the point where the pH started to go a little bit haywire, and I started adding acid. By the time I got it to the uh, standard 3.4, uh, the end result was that it was – how did I put it, Chris? Uh, enough – it was like licking the inside of a galvanized pipe. That's how – You said it was like oh. licking a nine-volt battery. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, it was bad. And then, you know, people told me, I ah, just let it sit a while. I was like, no, nah, you don't get this. This, this is not – this is not ever going to uh, be okay. Maybe in 150 years, but uh, this is not going yeah, to be Yeah, and I told, I told J.D. that uh, I said, you made a, the, the fatal mistake. Uh, you know, in the first part of fermentation, when you're managing it and uh, you're feeding it and putting your nutrients in and degassing, you're pretty much going by numbers then. Yeah. But once fermentation is over, and you're in secondary or tertiary or whatever, uh, there comes a point when you got to stop going by numbers and start going by taste. And, J.D., you were adding acid going by numbers. You were yeah. trying to get it to, to where you thought the numbers should be rather than just tasting it and saying, right. this is good where it's at. I'm leaving it alone. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, we've uh, since we're coming close to the end, I think we should probably at least cover real quickly uh, a little bit about restarting a fermentation. Uh, we've talked yeah. about all the things, all the things that can cause uh, can cause a fermentation to stick. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I really should have done I should have done my homework a lot better than I did. But let me just say that I believe on the Loudon. For Lalamond website, there is a protocol on there. If you'll search around on, on their website, you will find their recommended protocol for restarting a stuck fermentation. I'm gonna, I, I'm doing this from memory. It's been a while since I looked at it because I've only had to restart one so far, thank goodness. Uh, but when we were talking about the, uh, the sweet mead recipe and we were talking about, uh, tempering the yeast, uh, where we, uh, after we rehydrated it, we added in some must, uh, and the, the restart process is very similar to that. And, and like I said, go to that website and you can get the details. But basically what you're going to do is you're going to make up uh, like a one liter, uh, one liter of must that's at a lower gravity than your original batch was, and you're going to start your your yeast in that, and you're going to let that sit for 24, 36 hours, or whatever it takes to get that to get a good solid fermentation in that, and then you're going to start adding in in small increments your original must that's stuck. So you add, I think it was like half the volume of your starter. So you add a half a liter slowly, and then you don't do anything else to it until you see good, strong fermentation. And then so you add a little bit more. And you keep doing that, and you keep waiting until everything's going good. And once you've reached a certain volume, then all of that goes back into your original um, your original batch that's stuck, and that's that's the way to restart. <clears throat> that's if you were using um, the same yeast. If you're trying to restart using the same yeast, now there are some yeasts that are tolerant to a lot of different things that are good for restarting. Um, I believe uh, K1V eleven sixteen or is oh, it EC? 11, AC 1118. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's, there's a couple that Lawden recommends that are good for restarting stuck fermentations. Uh, I will say that 71B is, is pretty doggone tolerant 
uh, I've, I've seen 71B do, do some amazing things, uh, especially when you're working with a high gravity. Um, I've, I've been making some batches lately that have started at 1162 for a starting wow. gravity. Wow. <laughs> and the 71B just takes right off. The heart murmur is one of those. Yeah. It's starting way up high. And the heart murmur, uh, you know, it just, you put the 71B in, you rehydrate it, you temperate it, you pitch it, and it just takes off. But that kind of gravity would kill most yeast as soon as it touched it. Yeah. Well, so, 71B, uh, 71B is pretty much of a, a workhorse. I've used it uh, several times, and I, I've noticed the same thing. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, it's uh, so many of the stuff that I've done, it's usually 24 hours later before it really starts taking off. But 71B, it's like, you know, it's like let me in there. Uh, you know, it's just a matter of hours before I see bubbles start appearing in, in the airlock. So, yeah. But, yeah. And, and even though, even though Loudon doesn't recommend it as a restart yeast, uh, it's, you know, it's tolerant. Uh, in my experience, at least, it's tolerant to fairly low pHs. It's tolerant on low temperatures. Yeah. It's tolerant uh, to high gravities. And uh, it's it's a pretty doggone good yeast to restart with. Um, well, yeah. Everybody's going to have different, uh, different experiences, of course. I think it's always wise to try to restart with the same yeast that you pitched because I know certain yeasts can impart different things, uh, you know, in your muscle. I mean, I, I, to me, that would be the first rule of thumb is to always use the yeast that you started with. But if you get to a point where, uh, you know, you've tried everything, I, I, the recommended yeast is the EC1118 by Lalvin. Uh and uh, I guess a general rule of thumb, guys, is to uh, put a solution together, one part water, one part of your stalled must, uh, and, you know, put your yeast in. And, uh, you know, even if you got a quart jar that you could put an airlock on, let it get to a good rolling start, you know, and it, that might take you 24 hours. Uh, and then slowly, you know, work it back into your must, and uh, you know it should take off from there. So, but I, you know, I, I think the I think the big culprit is probably temperature. I mean, if you don't have some way of controlling your temperature, because like I said, you know, the inside of your house might be a comfortable seventy-two, even seventy-four degrees. Uh, don't forget that you know when you you pitch your yeast and it starts working and starts starts really working hard. Uh, your the temperature of your must is probably going to be approaching eighty five degrees, and that's pretty mm -hmm. much on the higher end of of uh, uh, you know where you need to be. Uh, so you know, uh, cool it off if you can. Uh, you repitch your yeast. Uh, try the eleven eighteen trick. Uh, you know. Uh, usually that will bring it back. If it doesn't, there's probably something else that's really gone wrong. And you just, you know, like all of us, you just might wind up pouring it down the drain and feeding the garbage disposal. So Yeah. But before before you go through the, the restart process of, of rehydrating yeast and all, uh, use your pH meter. Um, check your temperature. Try try warming it up. Try if your pH is below three. Uh, that's just a general number. You need to look it up. Uh, what depending on your yeast, but you know, check your pH and uh, try some uh, potassium uh, carbonate if it's too low. Um, uh, try to try to fix what's wrong first and see if that. You know, give it 24 hours and see if it works. It may bring it back to life. And then your your last option is to to start rehydrating yeast and making another starter and and uh, tempering it to uh, to your must. So uh, yeah. kind of go in order. Do the simplest things first. And uh, well, this, 
Go ahead. This has been an interesting discussion for me. I, I'm just kind of taking some notes here. In my experiences, fortunately, haven't had too many instances of stuck fermentations where, where I've had to, to get things going again. Um, you know, I think a, another key point I'd, I'd emphasize is as you know, you're know, you doing some of these corrective actions to get the fermentation back on track. And, and even if you don't experience a stuck fermentation, just another good practice is to you know take, take good notes of what's going on throughout the fermentation. Some of it, you know, we were talking about uh, managing the fermentation by numbers. So if there's things like taking a pH measurement or a, a gravity reading 24 hours in, 48 hours in, 72 hours in, just to keep track of, of progress and where things are going, you know, that's always a, a good thing to do. But also qualitative measurements or, or qualitative notes as well. You know, what's it tasting like as, as it's progressing yeah. through the fermentation as well? Um, yes. Yeah, and on your on your logbook, when you're taking your notes, one of the first things you need to write down before you even open your yeast, look on the yeast packet, and uh, there should be a lot number on there. And write that lot number down. And uh, so if something does go wrong and you do get stuck and you have to end up uh, re-pitching, don't re-pitch from that same lot number because it may just be a bad batch. Yeah. That's a yeah, really good, good idea. Yeah. Yeah, I never yeah. thought of that. Yeah, me neither. That's something new. I just want to uh, I want to throw another shout out to uh, Scott Monroe. He's uh, out of Corinth, Mississippi, a neighbor of Chris's down there. Uh, Scott is a uh, he's a chemical engineer and he's been listening to the show he's talking we were talking about uh, pH meters having to be calibrated every day uh, he's a he says he's a chemical engineer and he used them uh, quite extensively uh, during his career as a, as, as a uh, chemical engineer so uh, we've got the backing of uh, somebody who's uh, been in the business so yeah if you got a pH meter plan on calibrating it every time you use it uh, yeah I, mean, I got an email from I got an email from Scott uh, oh, did yesterday you? or day one yeah and uh, he said he wanted to hook up with me when when I got a chance, and he was going to give me some of his mead to try, and I'll uh, I'll try to have some of mine bottled up, and we might make us a mead swap when I, when I do a little bit more recovery. Yeah. <laughs> How are the chickens doing? <clears throat> the chickens are almost ready to come out of the brooder, <laughs> and uh, they're almost fully feathered now, so... Uh, hopefully by the end of July, sometime around the first of August, I'll be getting eggs. So, my first thought when uh, when Sherry sent me a text about Chris's accident, my first thought was, "Oh crap! What about the chickens?" I'll explain that on another show. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we're uh, we're we're pretty much at the end of the show, and we need to get ready for the after show here. Uh, real quick recap. We're talking about a sweet mead recipe that's really simple to put together. If you follow the instructions that are included on our website, themeathouse.com, copy it, paste it, print it, whatever you need to do, uh, you know, you should wind up with a, with a pretty decent uh, mead in about six to eight months. If you find yourself getting stuck during fermentation, you know, some of the things we talked about, uh, recognizing why it got stuck, check the pH, check your temperatures, uh, repitch if, you know, if at all possible with the same yeast that you started out with. Uh, Chris brought up a good point. Try to stay away from the same lot number. If you can get another package of yeast uh, from a different lot number, try that. If all else fails, try that uh, that EC uh, 1118 yeast. That's been known to be a terrific restarter, but you got to do it right. Uh, you have to put together a one to one starter with your, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, clean spring water and the the must out of your bucket, and uh, let it come to a you know a good ferment, and then slowly add it back into your into your must. 
So and guys, if that all fails and you have to pour it down the drain, then you get your official Mead Makers yep. uh, membership card. And yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> welcome to the world of Mead. Uh, call, call us first, uh, though. We might be able to help you out. And, hey, if you have a question, you want to talk about something. Uh, in fact, and I've gotten some emails from folks, uh, uh, a gentleman whose name uh, escaped me at the moment, but uh, – Wanted uh, to uh, wanted us to entertain a discussion about carbonating, so uh, we've got that on the list as well. But if you've got a question, you've got a topic that you want to know more about, hey, just go to the contact us page on themeadhouse dot com, and uh, we'll be certainly uh, uh, glad to include it on the show. You can also give us a, a holler, uh, call us anytime uh, during the show, and. Uh, if you got a paper and pencil, uh, write this number down, 818-921-4680. We'll take your calls all during the show. Uh, all we ask is you just don't be a knothead, that's all. Um, guys, next week uh, we're going to be talking about managing uh, – or no, that was actually – you don't know that. Managing a difficult fermentation. So now that we've – now that we have put our mix together – We've got it in the bucket. Uh, we helped it out when it got stuck. Uh, now we need to dig in a little bit deeper and start talking about how do we manage this thing efficiently so that we do get a, a good outcome. We'll spend a little more time about on the next show. But uh, Aaron, Jeff, uh, Chris, uh, good show tonight, guys. Absolutely. And hey, before before we call it a night, just a, a quick shout out and congrats to our very own Jeff Schaus. Just wanted to say congratulations to Jeff. I saw that uh, he took a third place medal here for a hibiscus mead here at the, the Mazer Cup. So congratulations, oh, to Jeff. Oh, wow, dude. How come I didn't see that in the note? <laughs> And we'll all be expecting samples. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh-uh. my if any of it that's left, we'll see what we can do. <laughs> U- U- UPS deliver. UPS delivers even in Mississippi. So, wow. Would you be? Uh, are you willing to share the recipe? Um, yeah, I'd be willing to, to share what I've got. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's up to you. Uh, give me a holler. Uh, and uh, we can get it posted up on the website. But uh, damn, congratulations! Absolutely, yeah, uh, yeah, big time, big time. Congrats! And All right. To be fair, it's not just hibiscus; uh, it's actually a, a blend of hibiscus and chamomile. Um, but the, the hibiscus is a. We actually won a third place uh, with a straight hibiscus meet the year before. Um, so the post I made was about consistency, and like, yeah, third place again with hibiscus. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, hey, right. uh, until next week, Tuesday night, 9 o'clock, right here at TheMeatHouse.com. Check it out. We'll see you next week.